Good morning. It's good to be with you today, worshiping our great God together. Um, before we open up God's Word, I just wanted to highlight our missionaries of the month, uh, which are Roger and Linda Bailey, who served many years with uh, New Tribes Mission in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, but now New Tribes has changed their name to Ethnos 360, and uh, Roger and Linda are back in the States, and Roger's serving in an administrative role with the Mid uh, mission agency. Um, they, I did uh, hear from him this last week, and uh, he gave us some things, uh, a report on the ministry and some things uh, to pray about, so I want to share that with you uh, quickly here. Um, so what he does is he serves as a, an initial coach for people who are uh, interested in serving with Ethnos 360. And um, he said uh, the people that he works with are either career candidates, people looking to go on the field full-time, or uh, associates, either part-time people on the field or even working in an administrative role like, like him. And he said that the number of career candidates is down this year. Uh, they had uh, about 45 candidates last year at this time and this year uh, they're at 32. Uh, also, he said the number of associates is down. They had 18 last year at this time, and right now they have three. So he said to pray for, for more workers to serve with uh, Ethnos 360. But he did have a, a positive report to share. Uh, the short-term mission trips where people who are interested in the mission agency can go to the different places where they're serving around the world. There's been great interest in, in participating in one of those trips this, under, this summer. They had over 100 participants go on those short-term trips. And so uh, obviously that uh, could generate future interest in serving with the, the mission. Uh, he also wanted to give praise that he and uh, Linda had a safe trip to Brazil uh, from July 5th through the 16th, where they were able to go to celebrate Roger's dad's 99th birthday. So uh, uh, that, I guess some of his siblings were able to be there as well. It was a good family reunion. Um, he did ask us to be praying for Linda's mom. Uh, you may recall that she deals with dementia issues and lives with Roger and Linda in New Jersey. And uh, She's immobile, so they have to stay with her, and they're not able to visit supporting churches like they want to. I think he was here two years ago, and he said that we were the last supporting church that he was able to visit. So we asked for prayer there. And also, Linda had oral surgery a week or two ago, and she's experiencing some complications from that. So he has to be praying for her, too. So the update is on the back of your uh, program today. I encourage you to refer to this throughout the month as you are praying for Roger and Linda. Okay, at this time you can take out uh, the sermon notes that are inside your program and use them as a guide as we study God's Word together. <clears throat> Several uh, years ago, my son Rex needed an oil change on his car. And because he was either in college at the time or in transition between college and PA school, he didn't have a lot of money. And so instead of directing him to go to Valvoline or uh, a dealership or something, I said, hey, I'll give you a hand with it. And so um, we picked up the stuff that we needed uh, at the store, uh, the oil and the oil filter. And um, I got the jack, uh, floor jack out of the garage and the stands. And I had one of those uh, swivel filter wrenches to take the, the filter off. And so we, we get the, the car up um, using the jack. We put it on the stand. And uh, I'm underneath there, and he's next to me watching me so he can learn how to do this himself. And I'm playing around with this uh, you know, swivel filter wrench, and it's not really getting around the filter very well. I actually think it's really an awkward tool. Probably not the best one to use, but I'm not having much luck with it. And it took a lot longer than I wanted to eventually get it to grip and to pull this thing off. And, um, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not really helping him much here. And then uh, as we removed the filter, I was uh, uh, surprised to see not black liquid coming out, but red into the oil pan. 
And so I thought, uh, this is not the oil filter. <laughs> I, I just removed the transmission oil filter. And of course, my son says, is that supposed to be red, Dad? The oil No, no, it's not. Um, so we had not prepared to change the transmission fluid that day, so we had to go back to the store. And then I spent more time trying to get the actual oil filter off. Uh, all of this just to say that um, it was just a reminder to me that I, I really lack the skills <laughs> to do maintenance or repairs on my vehicle. It's just the, it's just the truth. Uh, I've never been really good at it. Nobody showed me how to do that kind of thing when I was a young man, and they didn't have YouTube back then. Um, so I tried to wrestle with it, figure it out on my own. I never really got good at it. And now that I have a little bit more money than I had back then, I just am comfortable to let Valvoline or somebody else do it for me. But I will say this, back when I was in my 20s, when I was young, and family members and friends saw me struggling with this, I wish they would have offered to help. I wish they would have offered to show me the right way to do it, the easy way to do it, make sure I had the right tools so that I could be successful in that. And maybe you can relate, maybe you've had a, a similar experience. Ladies, maybe uh, when you were a newlywed, that you had this desire to be able to cook scrumptious meals for your husband and your future family, but the reality was you didn't have a clue how to cook. Maybe you were new parents and you're holding your little newborn son or daughter and you're like, I don't have a clue how to raise this child. Maybe you're a young professional who now have some money and you want to plan, prepare for your future and you want to invest that money. But you don't, have, you don't know how to do that. Maybe you're a ninth grader just coming out of middle school and now you've graduated up into the high school, but you don't know how the high school works. You don't know your way around the building. Uh, you're just not sure what to do. Maybe you're a new employee and uh, you're like, I, I just don't know what the expectations are here, what, what my boss really expects of me. And I think in all of those situations, if we were being honest, we would say, I wish somebody would just take the time to tell me or show me what I need to do to be successful. I, I think the reality is that people who are incompetent in an area of their life need someone with the necessary knowledge and or skill to show them how to be successful. But those who are aware of their incompetence offered often do nothing to help them get to a better place. And what's true in other areas of life is also true of someone's spiritual life. People are unable to navigate their spiritual journey on their own. They just don't have the insight to be able to do that well. And they need believers. They need people like us to help them. I would put it this way that followers of Jesus are to help people far from God take another step toward him in faith. And my friends, we're the only ones qualified to do that because we're the only ones who have been saved by grace through faith. We're the only ones who have a living, dynamic relationship with Jesus. So we're the only ones qualified to point people who are far from God to Jesus. Well, today we're going to be concluding our sermon series called Life on Mission, where we have been focusing on our responsibility as a church to make more disciples of Jesus Christ. That is to share the good news about Jesus with people who are far from God. And a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to remind you of our relational evangelism strategy here at Perryville Bible Church a strategy that we call pi squared. Uh, it's a formula where it's P plus I plus pi plus I. And the P uh, stands for pray. And the first I stands for invest. And the second I stands for invite. So pray plus invest plus invite equals our relational evangelism strategy. And um, the emphasis on pray was that we were to go to God daily and ask him to empower 
our evangelism efforts. Uh, the emphasis on invest is that as Christians, as Christ followers, we are to build authentic relationships and real friendships with people who are far from God. And today we want to focus on invite, where the emphasis is on helping people who are far from God take the next appropriate level of commitment in their journey towards Jesus. And the question that we want to answer is, practically speaking, how do we do this? And I, there is a passage in the book of Acts that provides an example for us of what this should look like. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you open up with me to the book of Acts, chapter 18. Acts, chapter 18, that'll be page 758 if you're using one of the Bibles here under the chairs. Page 758. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 24 through 28 together this morning. But before we dive in, let me give you just a little bit of background information. Uh, again, this is, uh, Paul is on his second missionary journey. And in the passage that we're looking at today, uh, he had been ministering in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. And he had brought this married couple with him from Corinth, the city that he had visited just prior to Ephesus, he brought them to this new city. Uh, the couple's name was Aquila and Priscilla. But then Paul decides that uh, even though the, the believers in Ephesus are asking him to stay, spend more time with them, to build them up in the things of God, he says, no, I need to move on. But I will leave Priscilla, uh, Aquila and Priscilla here, and they will continue to minister to you. So Paul leaves and goes on to Caesarea and Jerusalem and Antioch, concluding his second missionary journey. And he leaves this Christian married couple, Aquila and Priscilla, behind. So we need to know a little bit about this couple. Um, we're first introduced to them in, at the beginning of, of chapter 18. And we're, this is what we read. It says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, who was the Roman emperor at that time, had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So just from these, uh, in these first verses in chapter 18, we learn a little bit about this couple we know that Paul met them in the city of Corinth, that they had been living in Rome, but the Roman Emperor Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave. Um, and so they go to Ephesus. Uh, their occupation was to work as tent makers. That was Paul's occupation as well, how he raised money to be able to support his own personal needs while on the missionary journey. And so he learns that they're tent makers and he just partners with them, and they make tents together. And it's my belief that it is likely that it was while they are working together that Paul shares the gospel with Aquila and Priscilla, and they come to faith in Christ. And then Paul um, leaves, and they continue to minister in Ephesus. Now, I do want to say this, that uh, every time, and I do mean every time, that this couple is mentioned in scripture, uh, the wife is mentioned first. It's Priscilla and Aquila, which was very unusual because uh, the Roman Empire was patriarchal in that time. And to, to emphasize or put the, the name of the wife before the husband was very unusual. But remember that uh, Luke, who the writer of Acts, is writing for the benefit of the church other places where they show up in Paul's letters and elsewhere, these are letters to the churches. And probably why Priscilla is mentioned first is because in terms of their ministry together as a couple, Priscilla took on a more prominent role. Maybe, and she was known, more well known within the church than her husband. Maybe it was because of her hospitality or some other, other gift that she, had, she was well known for throughout the church in the Roman Empire. So that's probably why she is mentioned first. 
And, and this couple, we're going to see, God uses them to have a, a tremendous positive spiritual impact on the life of this unbeliever in Ephesus. So let's look to see who this man is. Uh, let's read verses 24 and 25 together. Luke says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. So this is what we know about Apollos, the man that Priscilla and Aquila are going to have this great, tremendous spiritual impact on. First of all, we know that he's a Jew. And as I just mentioned, Jews did not find favor with the Roman emperor at that time, Claudius. And so, but he's a Jew living in that time. He's a Jew who was from, originally from Alexandria, a city in Egypt that was known for its great learning and education. And then we're told that he came to Ephesus. Why did he come to Ephesus? Well, he came as a teacher. That'll be clear in the verses, the rest of the verses that we're going to look at here. He came as a teacher. We're told that he was learned, a learned man or learned man. Uh, other translations will use the word eloquent. And so Apollos was a scholar, but he was also a good communicator. And those two skill sets go very well together. He was also a man with a thir thorough knowledge of the scriptures, and the scriptures that were available at that time would have been the Old Testament scriptures. So he was a man who had been trained in and had a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. Verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. What is that talking about? Well, I believe that this is a reference to the fact that he had been instructed regarding the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And so he knew, based on the teachings of the Old Testament scriptures, what the Messiah was to be like and the character, what was going to characterize his coming. We're told that he spoke with great fervor or intensity. So take this together. Here's a man who is learned. He's a scholar. He's a good communicator. He's passionate in the way that he talks. Is that the kind of person that's easy or difficult to listen to? Easy, typically, right? If a person has, is, a, is a scholar and a good communicator and has passion in what he's saying, usually that person, it's easy to engage with them when they're talking. And that was true of Apollos as well. And, and then we're told that he taught, act, uh, taught about Jesus accurately. And so uh, I believe that while he's teaching there in Ephesus, he is teaching that Jesus is the Messiah that we're waiting for. I'm sure that he taught that. But he also may have heard from Christians elsewhere within the Roman Empire that, that Jesus had died and, and had risen again. And so I would not be surprised if he also taught that Jesus, our Messiah, has come. He died, and God raised him from the dead. We're told that he taught about Jesus accurately. But then at the end of verse 25, we read, though he only knew the baptism of John, John the Baptist. And so I, I need to say this that John's baptism was different, the purpose of it was different from believer's baptism, what we practice as a church today. With believer's baptism, uh, what we do is uh, a, somebody who's a, a new believer in Jesus Christ, they will want to obey Christ's command to be baptized. And so they, before a group of people, will publicly identify with Jesus by being immersed in water, identifying with Jesus in his death and burial and his resurrection. So it's a way, just a way that Jesus has commanded us to publicly identify with him, to announce that I am now a follower of Jesus. That's what believer's baptism is. That is not what John's baptism was all about. 
John's, the purpose of John's baptism was to prepare Israel for their coming Messiah. And they were living in sin. And so by being, by, when John baptized the Jews, it was a baptism of repentance. They, had, they were living in sin. They had hardened their hearts against God. They were not living the way that God wanted them to. And by being baptized, they were saying, I'm repenting of that. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning back to God so that my heart is ready to receive the Messiah when he comes. And we're told here that Apollos only knew the baptism of John. What I think that's telling us is this, that while Apollos taught about Jesus accurately, he's the Messiah, maybe even that he died and God raised him again, I do not think he understood the significance of why Jesus had to die and rise again. Why Jesus had to die. Why did he have to die? He died for our sins, right? He had to die in our place so that we would not be judged by God, but that we could have our sins forgiven and enter into a right relationship with him. And Apollos did not know that. He did not understand that. So I do not think, this is debatable, but I do not think at this point that even though Apollos was teaching about Jesus accurately, I still don't think that he was a believer yet. But he was really close, very close. So in terms of us as Christ followers, trying to help people who are far from God take another step towards Jesus, how does, what does, how does this relate? And I would say this, we need to discern where the person is on the spectrum of unbelief. We need to discern where the person is on the spectrum of unbelief. And then on the screen behind me, I've given a, a, a diagram with a spectrum of a, a, an attitude that unbelievers may have towards uh, Christianity. And, uh, so I, I would put it this way, uh, let's say uh, from zero, I'm sorry, one to five, uh, hostile towards Christianity would be the farthest away from being close to putting your faith in Christ. Seeking God would be a mindset or an attitude that would be very close. So here, here are the five. Um, uh, again, mindsets. Uh, the person may be hostile towards Christianity. Uh, that would mean that, that maybe they have an understanding of Christian beliefs, maybe not, but certainly they have bought into the, the cultural mindset towards religion in general and the church in particular, and they are starting to have a negative reaction towards anyone who identifies as a Christ follower. Uh, then there's ignorant of, of Christianity. They don't know about our Christian beliefs, and they don't really care to know. Indifferent towards Christianity might be the mindset, hey, you're a follower of Jesus. I'm okay with that. I just don't have any desire to be one myself. Uh, open to Christianity would be, you know what? I'm not, I don't really know a lot about Christianity, but I'm open to learning more. Would you, would you tell me about it? And seeking God would be, they're on a religious pursuit. They, they believe that God exists. They know that there are many religions in the world and many uh, claims about what God is like, who he is, and they're trying to figure it all out. So let me just make a, a few comments again about the spectrum uh, of unbelief. Uh, it's not meant, even though there's arrows here, it's not really meant to be a progression, right? People don't go from being hostile to God to ignorant of God and indifferent towards God. Uh, it is possible to start in one of those places and then move to being open to Christianity and seeking God. But typically, in, when you encounter someone, uh, they're going to be, who's an unbeliever, someone far from God, their attitude towards Christianity is going to be one of these five things. Second thing I want to just say is, uh, you understand that nobody seeks God on their own. And, and while I do believe that this happens, um, and again, you notice this is that mindset that is so close to being willing to accept Jesus, uh, believe in Jesus, as uh, the rescuer of our sins and the leader of our life. I think when we see people here, it's evidence of the Holy Spirit working within their life, 
to draw that person to God. Not always, um, but in many cases. The third thing I want to point out is that Americans today are more ignorant of Christianity and biblical teaching and biblical stories than even one or two generations ago. It's hard to say this, but I'm probably now a second generation here, uh, meaning there's I have children that are another generation, and they're old enough to have children that would be another generation. But when I was a kid, those that were in um, the, the group of people that I was around, and even in a public school, the average person knew something about the Bible. They, they knew who Jesus was. They knew basic stories from the Bible, basic teachings from the Bible. That is not necessarily true today. And we just need to be aware of that. We need to acknowledge that. And I do want to suggest this. This is just a personal uh, opinion. But I do think that uh, the starting place for many Americans that going forward, the people that you're going to be interacting with is going to be more and more hostility towards Christianity. Because like I said, uh, that is... Uh, really the attitude of our culture right now towards Christians. And the average American citizen will just buy into that mindset. Uh, I just see us, the trends are suggesting that uh, the church is becoming more and more disliked within our culture. And we're going to have to be ready to know how to engage with people when they already have a negative view of us before we even begin a conversation. So what do we do with this? So I would suggest this that in your interactions with someone who is far from God, assess where you think that, that they are on the spectrum of unbelief. Are they hostile towards Christianity? Are they ignorant of Christianity, indifferent towards Christianity, open to Christianity, or are they seeking God? And I'll be honest, you can't always know for sure. You, you can't always know for sure, but I think you can make a, an evaluation based on some general observations and again, this is a personal evaluation that you're making so that you can know how to better help this person take a, ne the, a, a step of faith towards Jesus. Okay, let's look at verse 26. Now we'll see how Priscilla and Aquila begin to uh, interact with Apollos. Verse 26, we read that he, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And so, uh, again, Priscilla and Aquila are Jews, right? And they're working as tent makers in Ephesus. So they're, they're working labor, a labor-type job during the week. But on the Sabbath, they're Jews, so what are they going to do? They're going to they're gonna go to uh, the, the synagogue. Now, they're Messianic Jews, they're, they're Christ followers at this point, but still, that was the practice of many Jews to still go to the synagogue for worship. And here comes Apollos, and he's teaching, and I can just picture Priscilla and Aquila there, they're listening to him, yep, this is good, yep, what he's saying about Jesus is good, and then all of a sudden, Apollos stops, and they're like, oops, <laughs> well, he, he said some good stuff, but he didn't really present the whole gospel. He didn't present the whole message. And I give them credit because they could have said, you know, just talked amongst themselves. You know, all that, like, like, like many of you do after the Sunday morning sermon <laughs> on your way home. You know, well, Rex said some good things today. I wish he would have said this. I wish he would have emphasized that. But they could have had that conversation. Uh, but they didn't, if they did have that conversation, they didn't stop there, right? They're like, wait a minute. No, he... He missed out. He didn't share the whole gospel. And, and somebody needs to tell him the rest of the story. And so they decide to invite the, this, this visiting itinerant preacher into their home in order to explain the gospel more adequately to him. And I believe that because they recognized that he was still outside of the faith, that he was uh, an unbeliever still at this point. And we're going to look at verses 27 and 28 in just a minute, but it's obvious that as a result of their invitation, inviting him into their home and to share the gospel with him a little bit more adequately, 
that he came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. So again, what can we take from this? I, I would suggest that we need to invite individuals to engage further with the truths of Christianity and the people of God. You see, that is what Priscilla and Aquila were doing by inviting Apollos into their home. They're saying, spend an afternoon with us. We are believers. Spend some time with us. Um, And also, as we spend time together, we want to help explain to you, help you understand the full gospel uh, that you are seem to be missing some of the key elements of it. And so in our interactions with people, we want to invite them to engage further with the truths of Christianity that, we, that come from God's word, but also give them the opportunity to rub shoulders, so to speak, with us and other Christians. I, I've shared this illustration before, about a year and a half ago, uh, but it's such a good illustration and it fits perfectly here that I I have to share it again. It's the salvation testimony of Rosaria Butterfield. Um, She was from my neck of the woods, uh, western New York. Uh, She was a professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University, just about an hour from where I lived. She was also a practicing lesbian, and she had a great disdain for Christians. And she was planning to write a book that was uh, targeted (laughs) towards Christians to make us look like fools. Well, she's in the process of uh, uh, research and and writing this book when Promise Keepers comes to town. Many of you know that Promise Keepers was a a men's movement um, back in the 90s and maybe early part of this century and uh, large gatherings where men would come for worship and for teaching. Well, they came to Syracuse University, and and, uh, Rosaria decided, uh, I got to write about this. And she just bashed the movement. She used it as an opportunity to to call out Christians as fools and imbeciles and all of that. And then after writing this article in in the Syracuse newspaper, she got a lot of mail. And about half of it was praising her for what she was saying about Christians. And others were from, other letters were from Christians bashing her for her position against the church. So she said, I got so much mail that I ended up having two boxes, one that was full of letters that agreed with what I was saying and another that was full of letters, people opposing what I was saying. She said, then I got this one letter and I didn't know where to put it because it was from Pastor Ken Smith of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. And she says in her testimony that it was the most kind letter of opposition that I had ever received in my life. And he he did not bash me. He did not mock me. He did not say I'm going to hell because of my beliefs. He just challenged me to defend my presuppositions. And... Uh, I think in the letter that he invited Rosaria to come over for dinner that he and his wife, Floyd, would host. And she said, I I didn't respond at first. I just kind of sat on that letter. But eventually I did decide to have dinner with them. And she admits, she said, when I accepted the invitation, my mindset was, at the very least, this will help me with my research for my book. She said, but then I went and had dinner with Pastor Ken and his wife, Floyd, and it was not what I expected. They really wanted to be my friend. They didn't preach the gospel to me. They didn't even invite me to church. We talked about politics and sexuality, and it was clear uh, in our time together that they held viewpoints or a a worldview different from mine, but uh, they were very respectful of me as a person and respectful of my beliefs. And so when they asked me to come back, I agreed. And she said, and a genuine friendship formed over time. And we would uh, exchange books and then talk about them. Uh, there, it came a point that I felt comfortable, Rosaria said, uh, of having Pastor Ken and his wife read the scripture with me and help me to understand its teachings. 
they entered into my world. They visited my friends, and uh, were, my friends found them to be respectful towards them. And as this relationship developed over time, they did share the gospel with her, and they did invite her to church. And she says in her salvation testimony that I'm in church one day, and we're singing this song where the words, this has become mine, were lyrics that were being sung, words that were coming out of her mouth. And she found herself saying, I do believe this now. I do believe that what the Bible teaches is true. This faith has become mine. And she acknowledges none of this, none of this would have happened if Pastor Ken had not decided to send the most kind letter of opposition that she had ever received. And I think, again, for us, that as we're thinking about uh, helping people to take another step of faith towards Jesus, that we want to invite them to engage with specific materials that speak to their level of unbelief. And this might, you might use a, an online sermon or a podcast, some music, books or booklets or videos to get the point across. And what I wanted to do in the next couple minutes is to try to help you think through uh, each mindset that a person, an un, a person far from God could have and how you would want to help them think through that uh, to take the next step towards Jesus. So let's say that you're interacting with somebody who's hostile towards Christianity. I would suggest what you want to do is understand where this hostility is coming from. Maybe that they, they had attended a, a local church before and it was a terrible experience for them. Maybe that from their perspective, they'll say, I did trust in God and he let me down. Or maybe they'll say, I, I, there can't be a God. I, I've suffered too much. I've experienced such hurt and pain my entire life. There can't be a good God. And so you want to hear that. You want to listen to it. You want to and then you want to be able to give a biblical perspective on what it is that they've experienced. For example, if, if the person says that they had a terrible experience while attending a local church, show sympathy towards that. Let them know that, again, not even Christians are perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And it's just an example or evidence that, that we still need the saving work of God in our lives today. But also remind the person that just because some Christians mistreated them. It doesn't mean that all Christians act that way. And maybe uh, I know Bill Hybels has said some great things about the church. You might want to point uh, them to a book by Bill Hybels or a video or something. Bill Hybels has said, there is nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking its potential is unlimited and help them to grasp a vision for what the local church could be, what it should be from God's perspective. What about somebody who is ignorant of Christianity? Well, I think you just, not all at once, not in one long speech, but in little conversations over time, you want, that, you want to help them understand the story of the Bible. You want to help them to understand what we do believe as Christ's followers. Maybe even help them understand the overarching theme of the Bible, which I believe is the glory of God. How the Bible shows how God is beautiful and, and majestic and marvelous. We see that in, in, in creation, the world that he's created, and how the Bible talks about that. We see that especially in God's plan of salvation for mankind and his plan and purpose for angels and demons and, and the nation of Israel. We see the glory of God and help them to understand that this is what the Bible is all about. How about somebody who's indifferent towards Christianity? I think you want to help this sort of individual to understand uh, the authoritative nature of the Bible. You see, the Bible is not just a religious book written by religious men. It is God is the ultimate author of Scripture. And the Bible is God's revelation of himself to mankind so that we can know what kind of God that he is and what he expects of us 
and our relationship with him. And so uh, I would encourage you to help them to see that the Bible, there, there is such a thing as absolute truth because there is such a thing as a God who is, who is completely truthful in everything that he says and does. I also would help a person who's indifferent towards Christianity to understand that you can't remain neutral on these things. You can't have the mindset that all religions uh, point to God or we can just live any way that we want, that the Bible makes very exclusive claims that Jesus is the only way to God, that there is only one true God. It's the God of Israel. Um, and help them to see that they can't just believe whatever they want. How about the person who's open to Christianity? I think with this type of person, you want to begin to introduce them to other Christ followers that you know. This is a great time to invite them to come and check out one of our services or one of our ministries here at Perryville Bible Church and, uh, or encourage them to watch one of my messages online. And the person who's seeking God, again, this is the one that typically is, is right there. It seems like God is, is working in their hearts and they are ripe and ready to believe. And so I would concentrate on sharing the gospel with them, the gospel presentation like uh, Two Ways to Live that I shared with you a few weeks ago. Um, God has a story, learn to tell it well. But you also can share your testimony with them, of what your life was like before you became a believer in Christ, how you came to know Jesus as your Savior, and what your life has been like since, how it's been radically changed. You have a story to tell, so learn to tell it well. Now, I do want to say here that you don't need to seek to close the deal every time that you have a conversation with somebody who's far from God. Yes, you should maintain uh, this, the sense of urgency, but you don't always have to close the deal. You can allow time for the Holy Spirit to work in that person's life and to convince them that the biblical claims that you're making are true. If you try to always close the deal, they might reject the message because they don't understand it yet. Not because there isn't any openness, but you're, you're trying to force this down their throat and, and have them make a, a decision right then and there, and they're not ready to do that. So they may reject the message, and, and it may be harder to reach them the next time. So allow time for God to work in their life. I would put it this way. Instead of seeking to close the deal, seek to put a pebble in their shoe. Now, that phrase isn't an, uh, original with me. It comes from Greg Kukul in his book, Tactics. But I love the imagery and I love the idea. What he's saying here is instead of looking to close the deal, just give them something to think about. Give them something to chew on. And so as you're ha engaging in conversation with somebody who's far from God and you want to be thinking and asking yourself, what, what's the one thing that I can say? What's the one question I can ask? What is the one thought that I can leave with them to get them thinking about reality, spiritual reality? Okay, let's look at verses 27 and 28. Uh, this is the outcome of Apollo's visit with Priscilla and Aquila. We read, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, I got to thinking about um, how Priscilla and Aquila, these tent makers, hear this reputable scholar who's a great communicator miss, you know, sh teaching in the synagogue and he's leaving out some key elements. And they could say, well, somebody should talk to him, but we're just tent makers. And he's got all these credentials. You know, who are we 
to speak into this person's life. And they could have been tempted to just say, we're just going to stay quiet. We're not going to say anything. But they didn't. Despite his credentials, despite the differences between them, they sought to help him. And what is the result? Well, we just saw it here in verses 27 and 28. Apollos became a great asset to the church. He wanted to go to Achaia. That was a province in the Roman Empire where major cities like Athens and and Corinth were located. Why did he want to go to Achaia? Well, we're not told here, but I I got a suspicion why he wanted to go there. My suspicion is that these are places that he had already visited, where he had already taught and engaged in debate and, and maybe taught in synagogues there. Why would he want to go back? So he could tell them the rest of the story. So he could fill them in on the things that he had left out so that they would have the opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're told that the church in Ephesus sent a letter of recommendation to the churches in Achaia. Why would they feel the need to do that? Here's my guess, because he had been there before. And some of the believers had a question as to whether or not Apollos was one of them yet. And so they wanted to affirm in their minds that whatever you thought about Apollos before, we're endorsing him now. We believe he, is, he does have a full understanding of the gospel and that he is now one of us. He's a follower of Jesus. And so we're told that Apollos was a great help to the churches in that province. And I believe what that means is that he had become a great preacher of the, the whole gospel and a great apologist who could defend the faith. We know that because of the fact that he was able to refute his Jewish opponents there in those cities. Again, what can we take from that? Here's what I would say. In your interactions with people who are far from God, be motivated by what the person can become by God's grace rather than focusing on where they currently are. This last week, uh, my wife and I traveled down to Lynchburg, Virginia, just to visit family. And uh, our son, who lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, came up. We spent some time together. And he shared this uh, story with me, a true story that happened to him a few weeks ago or recently uh, that I just found uh, really uh, interesting. He said that um, he was prepping for surgery with one of the most well-known, well-respected heart surgeons in the whole state of North Carolina. And Rex is going to assist this surgeon in a, a surgery that he was performing. And as they're prepping for the surgery, the surgeon asks Rex, so what do you do in your spare time? What do you do when you're not working at the hospital? And Rex says, well, I spend much of my time with other believers. And we we have a a group of people that get together every week and we study God's word together. We pray for one another. We encourage each other in the things of God. Uh, I try to serve in my local church and try to serve my community. I'm even, I'm taking some seminary courses. I'm not sure what God will, what, what, where God will take me with that, but I just want to be able to learn the Bible better you know, so that I can uh, know God and and how I'm supposed to live before him. And I don't, you know, uh, Rex didn't say that the the surgeon made a a negative comment to all that. I think he just made a kind comment and kind of moved on to something else. But I was, I, I had great respect for Rex to do that because this is one of the most well respected, well known surgeons, heart surgeons in all of North Carolina, and Rex did not allow this man's credentials to keep him from sharing his faith with him. And I think we can learn from that. So the questions I want to ask you this morning are twofold. Are you so intimidated by another person's credentials that you're unwilling to initiate a spiritual conversation with them? Or maybe the opposite is true. Do you view others as being beneath you and not worth your time? I think in either case, what I encourage you to do is 
to pray and ask God to give you a picture of what that person can become by God's grace. And then let that motivate you to serve them by pointing them to Jesus. So to kind of pull together everything that we've been talking about today, here's the challenge that I would give you. First of all, I want to encourage you to identify where the people on your pi squared list are in in terms of their spectrum of unbelief. Now, if you've been part of this sermon series, you'll know that the pi squared list is something that we gave out a couple weeks ago where you are to write down the names of four people you know in four categories of relationship, um, people in your sphere of influence, a family member, a friend, a coworker or classmate, and a neighbor. And hopefully by now you've got four names listed there. You're praying for those people. You're looking for opportunities to continue to invest in those relationships. Well, here I want, as you're thinking of those four individuals, I want to challenge you to try to identify where do you think they are on the spectrum of unbelief and then determine what they need to hear or to understand in order to take another step forward uh, towards Jesus then help them to work through those issues and then personally invite them to take a specific step towards Jesus in faith. So that's my challenge to you uh, this morning. Listen, if you will invite people who are far from God to take another step of faith toward him, you may or may not be used of God to actually help them cross the line of faith. But I can say this for sure. You will be planting a seed in their heart. And somebody else, God may bring somebody else into their life to water that seed. And down the road, God may also bring somebody else into their life to reap the harvest. But you were part of it. And I don't want you to be the type of Christ follower who sees someone who's far from God struggling in their life because of their hard heart toward God or because of their unbelief or just leaving God out of their life. I don't want you to be the kind of Christ father who sees that and never does anything to help them to take another step of faith towards Jesus. You know, the person may not initially express appreciation for what you're doing, but if God continues to do a work in their heart, through your engagement with them, there could come a day when they say, you know, I became a Christ follower because of your persistent invitations to me to take another step of faith towards Jesus. And I'm so glad that you did because I would not be where I am today if God had not used you in my life. And I can't think that there's anybody here today who identifies as a follower of Jesus who would not want to hear those words spoken of them, who would not want to be used of God in that way. So keep inviting people to take that next step. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, our time together this morning around your word and this uh, series on uh, Life on Mission where we've been able to focus on the gospel and our responsibility and our privilege as a church to take the good news about Jesus to people who are far from you. And so, Lord, help us to take that command seriously and to own it, not just as a corporate body, as a family of believers, but as individual believers as well understanding this is what you desire of each one of us. And uh, Lord, as we seek to build relationships with people, uh, I pray that you would give us opportunities uh, to speak into their life and to help them to take another step of faith towards Jesus. And um, we anticipate that you will give us those opportunities And we're excited to see what you will do with them in the lives of the people that we're ministering to.
give us more opportunities. We, we want to see, as a church, we want to see more and more people come to a saving knowledge of Christ through our ministry, to see them baptized, to see them join our church, to have the privilege to be able to disciple them in their new found relationship with Christ, to have them become a part of our family. Would you allow us as a church to be used of you in that way? I ask that you would. In Jesus' name, amen.